Ooh. Ooh, that's too nice. Let's make it go. Can I go closer? Seems okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's okay. I think you're pretty close, so. It's okay. Yeah. I'm gonna mute this. A very good evening to all of you. And it's my pleasure to invite you all for this program on nutrition at the cutting edge, which is an update on the role of muscle and body composition in health. Preserving muscle mass is often a losing battle in the face of critical illness, and poor muscle mass is one of the predictors for morbidity, mortality, and prolonged hospital length of stay. And of course, an increased vulnerability to infection and failure to wean from the mechanical ventilation. But as Dr. Wishmeyer, has shown with his work and personal experience, it is for far from a last chance, last, lost cause, sorry. I hope this lecture, which you will be listening on muscle matters, measure, monitor, and intervene, will enlighten us on the pivotal role of nourishing this system of muscle and yet play an ensuring low role on health in our uh, patients. I want, uh, I invite, oh, that's not there. May I uh, invite Dr. G. V. Rao, our Chief Gastroenterology, Surgical Gastroenterology and the Director, AIG Hospital, to welcome the guest and uh, uh, introduce the concept on muscle. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Dr. G. V. Rao, a giant surgeon practicing at AG Hospitals. On behalf of uh, the faculty staff of AG Hospitals, a warm welcome to Professor Paul Wishmeyer, who is the Professor of Anesthesiology and Surgery, executive of heading both the departments, actually. He's got an incredible work that he has done on nutrition. There are several myths and uh, that we go through and I think most of these myths that we have I think will be resolved by the time we listen to Paul Wishmeyer about his talk on the sarcopenia, the muscle mass that we talk about. Coincidentally, I'll, uh, though it, I'll just go out of my way to introduce uh, Paul Wishmeyer. He doesn't look, but he has gone through this entire process himself. I was told at the age of 15 years, this gentleman, when he never knew anything about medicine, has taken some antibiotic for some sore throat infection, ended up with massive GI bleed for which he received about 40 transfusions. Subsequently, he was diagnosed to have inflammatory bowel disease. 
And mind you, he's gone through umpteen number of surgeries himself. And I request everybody to follow Professor Paul Vishwar on his social media to see how he's gone through this trauma, surgical trauma, and how the day he is standing before us today, it speaks volumes about what he has gone through and the amount of work that he has put in to make sure that he can convey the same thing to us. We don't uh, talk about all this, actually, surprisingly, it is not only India. Actually, I have gone through some literature which says that, especially the perioperative nutrition, Africa's is almost equal to Americas. I might say that actually India is a developing country and US is very developed. When it comes to the ICU nutrition, I think Africa's and Americas are equal. There is no difference because basically because of the ignorance on part of the intensivist surgeons who fail to practice the real practice. The muzzle mass, what he's talking about actually, I suggest that uh, anybody who shakes hand with Dr. Paul Wishmeyer will know the hand grip. <laughs> that speaks volumes of the muzzle mass that he is able to retain in spite of all the trauma that he has gone through. I had pleasure of shaking hands with him just a couple of hours back, and the grip is incredible. I think that that is the gold standard actually for the, all the nutritionists that you can talk about. And if you want to go through his CV, it is not pages, it is turns into books actually. So thank you so much for sparing your time here. And I am sure that a uh, lot of bits that we have uh, will be cleared by the time we listen to you. Welcome to Paul Vishal. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. You can really hear me. I have to talk quiet. So it, it truly is an honor to be here. Can you guys turn the volume down on the mic? I'm going to stay further away from the speakers for a minute. But it's... It, now I keep... Okay. Yeah, good. It's really an honor to be here with all of you. And, and it, it, it still amazes me that you have a hospital that is so committed and so dedicated to... GI disorders, and, and that a hospital like this exists, it, it, to my knowledge, is the only one I know of in the world that is so committed to caring for patients like I'll show you myself with GI disorders. But, but what I'm here to talk to you about, of course, is, is the muscle and, and how nutrition is, is an essential part of recovering our patients and preparing our patients for the things that they go through in hospitals like this all over the world. And the real one message, if you take home anything or remember anything that I say to you today, it's this, that when we're on rounds every day, we need to not only worry about the outcomes of our patients in the next hour to days while they're in the hospital, but every day on rounds, we should think about what are the things that we can do that are going to ensure they have a life to go back to after they leave the hospital. And it's critical that we do things every day from the day they're admitted, and actually perhaps even before they're admitted, to ensure they have the best possible outcomes. And that really relies on us. Because what our patients want from us is to go back to a life that's worth living, a life as a survivor, a life that brings them back to the state of health that they came to us in the first place to restore, as opposed to a victim, someone that perhaps never goes back to the life they had before, perhaps never even goes home because they go to a rehabilitation center or a nursing home, and perhaps they pass away or die there, and we never know it. We think they leave the hospital, they must be well, but the reality is many of them never go back to a life that they want, because ultimately what people want is to be able to walk down the street with the people they love again, and hold their children again, and, and have the life they had before. Because I think the key message I'm going to share with you is, is having a major operation, whether it's a GI operation or a transplant or, or cancer care even, is like preparing and, and running a marathon. And in this case, right, this is the marathon of our patients' lives. And it's critical that we not only think about how we're going to prepare them for this marathon with nutrition and exercise. How many of you in the room have run a race before on the road? 
How many of you have run races? So a number. And so you know it takes preparation and training, and it does for our patients as well. And that's critical, of course. And so, again, the, ra the race we're talking about is the race of this patient's lives. And so what happens to our patients, as is all too common, when they're not prepared and when they go through this race not really ready. And we're going to talk about that. And of course, it's not the marathon of the road, the marathon of the hospital or the operating room. And to tell you about this and, and how perhaps we can be better at it, I'm going to tell you about a patient I cared for just very recently at Duke where I work in the hospital I work in. His name was Elijah. And he was an 89-year-old man. Yes, 89. We operated an 89-year-old who had rectal cancer. And he was coming for a resection. And he had been losing weight because of his rectal cancer. In fact, he lost 10 kilos in the three months before surgery. And he told me he was feeling weaker than usual. He didn't feel quite as strong. And he was quite concerned about that because he was a very active man. In fact, the day before surgery, he was on the roof of his house and the roof of his church fixing the gutters on the roof. So this is a very active 89-year-old with a very active life. And he told me that this surgery was very important to him because he needed to have it so he could meet his new granddaughter who was just born the week before, who we never met. And this is what motivated him to get through this and to have this done. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is this man ready for surgery? Well, we can already say from a 10 kilo weight loss that he's not. And unfortunately, he came to our pre-op clinic on a Friday for surgery on a Monday. And we probably should have not operated on him. This was an elective surgery, obviously. But as all too often is the case around the world in our hospital too, sadly, we did. And so Elijah went to the operating room, and for the first few days, he did pretty well. But unfortunately, on the third day, he began to have abdominal pain and rectal bleeding. He began to have bleeding from his, from, from his rectum. And he began to get sicker and go into shock. And so he got rushed to the CT scanner where an anastomotic leak was found. And as he went into shock, he was rushed to the OR with actually one of my very favorite IBD and, and GI colon surgeons. And he was found in the operating room to have ischemic bowel. Unfortunately, his shock worsened. And on the operating room table, he had a cardiac arrest. And he got CPR for five minutes on the operating room table. Remember, he's 89 years old. And he came back to the ICU with an open abdomen, in shock, very weak, on the ventilator. And of course, he's already malnourished to start. And I began to get questions from my nurses and my trainee physicians, my young physicians, saying, can he actually survive this? Maybe we should just withdraw care. Is he just maybe just too old and too sick? He's nearly 90. Is it the right thing to do to even try to continue to treat this man? Maybe we should just stop. Well, the surgeon and I had talked to him, and both of us knew that isn't what he wanted, and that isn't what his family wanted. I understood the concerns of the nurses and the residents. He is almost 90, and he has a lot of challenges in front of him, and this nutritional status and his muscle mass being one of the biggest. But he, both he and his family said, we want to fight. We want to live. He wants to meet his granddaughter. He wants to go back to a life that looks like the life he had before. Can you give us that? Remember, he was quite active, too. He didn't want to go back to a life in a bed. He wanted to go back to a life active. And so he said, no, we're going to fight for this man. I'm not sure we can save him. I'm not sure we can ever get him out of the hospital, but we're going to try. And so the question is, can we save patients like this at the extremes of life, perhaps, at the extremes of age, and give them their lives back? Right? And the question we need to ask ourselves every day as we round in the hospital, are we creating survivors or are we creating victims? And we need to be doing things every day that create survivors, not just for the next days, but for the next months to years. And what are those things we can do? Because this is truly a challenge. Our patients that are in the ICU, even 40 and 50 year olds, for more than a week, half of them won't go back to the job they did before for a year because they're too weak or have other disabilities. And a third of these young patients, not 80-year-olds, but 40-year-olds, won't go back to work ever to the jobs they did before because they're too weak or too disabled because of what's happened to them in the ICU. And no one's immune to this. Not young people, not old people, not even kids have disabilities after 
ICU stays, and we often never see them as the people that work in the hospital. We know that if you spend more than five days on a ventilator, 60 to 80% of those patients at virtually any age will have disabilities that last for weeks to months to years or a lifetime. And that's true in major surgery as well. My mom had a cardiac surgery about a year and a half ago, and she's never been the same. She's still in physical therapy. And so these are challenges our patients face that we never see, but we need to be thinking about every day. And of course, this is an epidemic, and COVID-19 hasn't made this better. Long COVID is real, and I care for patients with it. And the question is, why are we losing this quality of life war? Well, the reality is our patients can lose a kilogram of lean body mass a day, of muscle mass and lean body mass a day. How long do you think you can survive that? I'll show you that this is true in a very personal way in a moment. Because the problem is, we as humans are not meant to survive the things we do to patients in tertiary care hospitals like this. Catabolism can persist for months to years. A burned child will remain catabolic for two years after they leave the hospital. We're not born to survive these kinds of illnesses, and food and the routine things we do won't allow us to do it. And of course, COVID makes that more challenging. The reality is patients will gain weight back. The dietitians have probably seen this. You can feed them a lot of calories. Sometimes they don't gain weight at all, but over a year they will. But a lot of it's fat mass. It's not muscle mass. It doesn't improve their functional quality of life or the things they can do. And is there something we can do to change that? Because again, Mother Nature has not intended for us to survive. And just feeding them the food, the bad hospital food no less, is not going to change this. Because we're not supposed to survive these kinds of things. And so this is an epidemic for our patients and one that is happening outside of our hospitals, often where our eyes don't see it. And so we need to be better. And how can we do that? Well, it's going to take a combination of therapeutic nutrition, rehabilitation, and even precision exercise, the kind Olympic athletes do. We do trials on this in our patients around surgery and after COVID using techniques Olympic athletes use, and we use them in elderly people. So what are our goals to recover our patients and what makes them ready for surgery? Well, clearly recovering muscle mass is critical. And so that is one of our foremost goals either before or after surgery or after illness. And personalized nutrition is the best and only way to do this in most of our patients, giving the right dose to the right patient at the right time. And to do that, we have to measure. We have to use things like BIAs and metabolic carts and the other techniques we use to really objectively measure what we do. Because as Lord Kelvin said, if you can't measure, you can't improve it. And um, John louis Vincent, who's a, one of the premier critical care doctors in the world, asked me to co-edit an issue on personalizing nutrition. And we have authors around the world. If you want to read more, I'm happy to share those articles with you. So back to Elijah, our 89-year-old. We, we made measurements of his muscle when he reached the ICU. And we used two techniques to do this. We use BIA like you do. You're one of the only hospitals I found in the world that has the ability to do that. That's really brilliant. And then we use muscle mass ultrasound. This is a muscle-specific ultrasound that we hope one day every dietitian will have in their pocket. And it, I'll show you, plugs into your iPhone. It's a probe about this big. And it measures not only mass, but muscle glycogen. You can actually tell if the patients are taking up and using the nutrition you're giving them. You can tell if they're drinking their oral nutrition protein drinks from week to week and day to day. These red colors represent the glycogen in the muscle, and this is validated with muscle biopsy. It's the only thing I've ever seen that can measure nutritional adequacy. But you can see his muscle, and this is his rectus, his leg, is very small. And this is where he was starting. And you can see from his BIA measurements, he had high fat mass and low muscle mass. And so this is a big challenge for this patient starting off. And that's the real question, right? We, we, we've been for years using simple questions like, have you lost weight and are you eating less? to measure malnutrition as we, our dietitians do so well. But do we have better tools to assess? And I know in your hospital you're beginning to use these. Because the challenge for I think a lot of us is, who's more fit for a major operation? This thin, healthy appearing man? Or this obese, perhaps pre-diabetic gentleman here? Who's, who's likely to have complication? The first man or the second man? And for a moment, I'll ask the question, what's the best BMI to be to survive virtually any illness, trauma, stress, or surgery? Is it 25? Is it 30? Is it 35? I, the people in the front row know the answer. The answer is 30. I don't see many BMIs of 30 in the room, so maybe everyone needs to eat a little more. But the reality is, if you're going to get hit by a bus or hit by a surgeon, 
the more BMI you have, and we think this is related to muscle mass, and that's why it's key to measure, the more likely you are to survive. And this is true in virtually every disease that's been studied, and it's called the obesity paradox. We think of those obese patients as being at risk for all sorts of complications, and they do have more complications. But they survive more often. That's true in many diseases, heart disease, trauma, lung disease. It's true in critical care as well. This is data from ARDS studies, and you can see the survival from ARDS is a straight line down to a BMI of 40, which, of course, we would think is very unhealthy. But they survive the most often. They have more complications, but they live more often. And in the critical care world, it's true too. And I think what's interesting here is not the high BMIs, but the fact that a BMI less than 25 puts you at significant risk of death. And we think this is because your muscle reserve, your metabolic reserve to survive insults and injuries is less. In fact, there's brilliant data from the Blue Journal, one of the highest impact factor ICU journals, that says your chance of surviving and walking again independently at home goes down 7% for every point lower your BMI is. So again, if you're a woman with a BMI of 30, you're 60% more likely to go home and live a meaningful life again than a woman whose BMI is 22. And this is true in risk of death and risk of function. So what makes us fit metabolically? What is that thing that does it? Of course, it can't just be the fat mass. We actually, of course, think it's the muscle mass. If any of you ever run a race and had someone that looks like this running in front of you and you can't catch them, this is the reality of you can't look at someone and tell if they're fit or not, or if their muscle mass is good or not good. I've sadly experienced this lots of times. It's depressing. And of course, muscle mass is what we think is the critical thing. And so before I came to India, I wanted to understand what challenges you face. And so I looked at some independent data that was done. A lot of this was using BIA data, actually, where they looked at a large number of Indian citizens, healthy people, and they found that seven out of 10 people in India have significant depletion of muscle mass. It's 71% in fact, and of course, the problem here is this isn't elderly people. This was true in 30 to 50 year olds. 70% had poor muscle mass. And so this is about the number we see in our 60 to 70 year olds in the US. So again, we're not a very fit country either, but our older people tend to fall into low muscle mass at this level, I'll show you some data. But here it seems as though this challenge begins much younger. And so, it seems to be even more true that people that work in cities in India have lower muscle mass than those that live in the country or the rural areas because they're more active in the rural areas, whereas the people in the city sit behind a desk and don't move. And their diets seem to be poorer as well, and we'll talk about that. But this leads to a lot of risks for the average Indian citizen, especially those that work in cities. And the data was broken down by city as well. And so it, even in Hyderabad, Hyderabad actually one of the most challenging muscle masses of all the Indian cities, but they all were quite similar around the 70% mark. And so this is a challenge, of course, that I think uniquely you face. Why is this? Well, the Indian Dietetic Association wanted to understand this better. And so they did a study, and they found, of course, as all of you would probably guess, that 84% of diets of the average Indian citizen is a vegetarian diet that's pro or poor in protein. But what they also found was those that were not vegetarians in India largely had poor protein intake as well. This was not unique to the vegetarian. It was part of what Indians eat in general every day. This is also true in the US, by the way. And this reason was because 93% of the people the Dietetic Association surveyed said they didn't know protein was important. They had never really gotten any advice about nutrition from a doctor or anyone else in their life. And where would they get that, right? We don't get taught that in medical school. As physicians, we don't really have the training to teach you what to eat and what not to eat, and that's what the dietitians do, of course, but most patients don't get to see a dietitian until they're hospitalized, perhaps, and then it's often too late. So this is an emergency here in this country, just like it is in our country, and, and I think you face some unique challenges. And of course, one of the challenges is even in very young people, as we saw in the data from India, muscle mass begins to be lost at age 21, and significant muscle mass can even be lost in 30 and 40 and 50 year olds. It goes up a great deal more as we age and we get into our 70s, but it even is lost in young people as well. And all of us after age 21 lose about 1% of our mass per year and 3% of our strength per year. Because mass and strength aren't the same things. Just because you have a high muscle mass doesn't mean that muscle is of high quality or of great function. And so they're independent. They both need to be measured. And of course, having a disease 
like the kind we care for in our hospitals, of course, makes this worse and contributes significantly to accelerating this muscle loss, as all of you could guess. And so, in addition to what disease does and diet does, one of the biggest challenges our patients face is what the bed does to them. As I, I was talking in the boardroom with your physicians, I, I walk through the ICU every day and I tell my patients who are awake that I don't want to see them in the bed all day. They can either be in the chair or they can be walking. Bed is only for sleeping. Beds are poison. They cause complications and death. They're not meant for people to be in during the day or unless they're having a procedure. Because the reality is if we lay down a 21-year-old man in a bed for 28 days, they won't be able to walk. Our space agency did those research with astronauts years ago. So if we laid one of you down for a month, you wouldn't be able to walk either. But if you're elderly and you don't move in a bed for 10 days, you lose much more muscle. And if you're a sick elderly person, it only takes three days to lose that much muscle. Perhaps until now, there's actually something I'm going to show you that will reverse this almost entirely. But the bed is bad for you, and it makes our patients' muscle less much work. We've got to get them out of bed and get them walking. And this is the vicious cycle our patients go through, right? They have chronic inflammation because of their disease. This inflammation then breaks down more muscle. More muscle gets broken down. Their immune system works poorly because amino acids are critical to immune function. They get another infection and their catabolism gets worse and this cycle goes on and on. And that's why as dietitians, you'll see you'll feed someone 40 kcals per kilo and they won't gain weight. They need an anabolic signal. They don't just need protein, which they have to have or it will never work. But they need a signal and we'll talk about how now maybe we can actually do that in a simple way. And so how do we measure muscle mass and function? And I won't spend a ton of time in this part because it sounds like you in this hospital, the people on the dietitian side do a very good job of this. But of course, when you measure muscle, you can't just measure mass. You have to measure strength. And so your physical therapists are critical. Sit to stand tests and six minute walk tests and hand grip strength and all the key tests that need to be done. And then muscle quantity by CT scan or ultrasound or BIA is also critical. And then physical performance, the six minute walk test, the time up and go test. We use cardiopulmonary exercise testing like an athlete would use to tell where our patient's VO2 peaks are, and that's how we guide their exercise training. So, but a lot of times, most hospitals have to do it the old-fashioned way. They have to use arm circumference and physical examination as dietitians are taught, but we as physicians really aren't. And that's why your role is so critical, because that's where most of our data comes. But hand grip strength can be quite useful if it's done correctly. We'll talk about that. And physical performance tests, our physical therapists do, and they put them in the chart. Most of us as physicians don't read them. But as my research, I'm forced to read them. And I've learned, gosh, they do a lot every day, just like you guys do. So the calf circumference is one of the most common measures used throughout the world. And it's quite useful because there's standards and normals that are based for each different part of the world in different countries. Because in every country, your calf circumference normal is different. I'll tell you, in the US, it's pretty big because we have so many obese patients, and so it's hard to add an obese population. Muscle strength can be quite done nicely with hand grip strength testing. Of course, we know there's limitations to this. It's easy to do in a patient who's in a clinic. Not so easy to do in a patient in the hospital. They have to be sitting to do it accurately. And so our dietitians will occasionally do this, but we do this in a lot of our research studies, and our physical therapists do this as well. But again, the patient can't lay down and do it accurately. They have to be sitting in a chair. The sit-to-stand test is one of the best tests. This is one of the most fundamental things that tells you if your patient's going to get their life back or not. They've got to be able to stand up out of a chair. This is one of the biggest challenges for my mom after her cardiac surgery is getting her nose over her toes and being able to stand up without help. And so this test, the number of times you can do a sit-to-stand is really a robust test. We do it in all our research studies as well. And then for muscle quality and muscle mass, the CT is the best. And I know you've been doing this here, and that's brilliant. There are dietitians using the free software in the US as well to do this, and our radiologists are starting to do it. At the Harvard hospitals, the radiologists now report muscle mass on every abdominal CT obtained in the whole hospital system. And our insurance, government insurance, pays for it. They're the first hospital system to pull this off. We have a dream that all hospital systems will do this. The software to do this is free. And so they do it. And that's brilliant because many of our patients get CTs. Is low muscle mass important to clinical outcomes? We know it is. In the ICU, all of the factors being equal, if you enter the ICU with a low muscle mass, your mortality is exceedingly higher. All of the things being equal, right? This is one of the biggest predictors of a patient's going to live or die is their metabolic reserve, their muscle mass. This study is one of my favorites. This was done by a very good friend of mine. She's a trauma surgeon. 
She runs the Surgical Trauma Research Group at Shock Trauma in Maryland, Trauma Hospital in the US. And she looked at patients who were elderly patients who were healthy, getting in car accidents mostly, so trauma patients, elderly trauma patients, average age of 79. 71% of those patients were sarcopenic at admission after their trauma because they all got CT scans, so we had this data. But what is key about this is you couldn't look at the patient and tell if they had low muscle mass or not. Whether they were thin, normal weight, or obese, there were an equal number of low muscle mass patients. You can't eyeball a patient and do this. But what we did find was your chance of dying, all other things being equal, was twice as high if you entered the hospital after your trauma with low muscle mass. I take care of a lot of trauma patients, and when people fall and have rib fractures, I can tell you who's going to survive this and who probably is going to have their life ended by it. It's the thin, cachectic person who falls. Once they have a rib fracture, they can't breathe, they get pneumonia, and they pass away. And this is where we need to make a difference. And this is true in GI cancer surgeries. This is where most of the data in the world exists for sarcopenia. It's just a pancreatic surgery study showed mortality was much higher with a low muscle mass patient than a higher muscle mass patient. There's big meta-analyses of this in surgical oncology as well that show sarcopenia prevalences range by the disease type, but there's significant increases in complications in all the surgeries that have been looked at if people have surgery with low muscle mass versus those that don't. I think this is one of the most compelling studies I've ever seen that's looked at cancer and what muscle mass and weight loss does. If you're diagnosed with cancer, and this is the big group, and you've lost weight or you're diagnosed with low muscle mass, your life expectancy is eight months when you begin treatment. If you have not lost weight, your life expectancy is two years longer, right? This is the reserve that you have to tolerate and survive the cancer because the cancer is trying to eat you alive. That's how cancer wins. It takes away your muscle and impairs your immune function because you need amino acids to surveil in your immune system. So can we be better at assessing and can we have tools to do this? And one of our favorite tools that we use is the ultrasound, as I mentioned. And this can be done by anyone. You know, when I was a resident, when I was a young physician, we started central lines blindly in the ICU and in the OR. We would never do that now. We have ultrasounds to do that. We would say it was safe to do that blindly. I would advocate the same thing is true now of muscle mass assessment. You have an ultrasound in all your ICUs, all your hospitals. Muscle mass is brilliantly done by this, the rectus and the temporalis. This muscle is easy to assess. We have a muscle-specific ultrasound we actually use that gives us glycogen as well, like a muscle biopsy. And it gives us the ability to tell if patients are drinking the drinks we want them with their protein or not. And it's brilliant. It, it looks like this. It's a probe about this big. It plugs into your iPad or iPhone. And it gives you pictures like this. And the darker the purple, the more glycogen they have. And then measures mass and quality for you in about two minutes. And then it gives you a report. And it gives a number to the muscle glycogen. My dream, is, as I said, is every dietitian will have this in their pocket. And this will be to the dietitian what the stethoscope and blood pressure cuff is to the nurse. This is what you all need. This is what it looks like. The device actually tells you if you've done it correctly. It self-corrects. It auto-corrects you if you haven't done the muscle in plain. And it's very simple to do. And we do these very frequently in our pre-op clinic and in our ICUs. And it's a really robust way to measure muscle. We also measure the temporalis. It's a mixture of slow and fast twitch. And it's not affected by edema because it's right here. They also don't have to take their clothes off. And then the last thing, of course, is the BIA. And the BIA is a brilliant device, of course, as I know you have one here. You're one of the really lucky hospitals that have one. And we've begun to use them as well. And we use the phase angle a lot. And there's a lot of publications coming out about the phase angle, which is one of the measures of BA and its ability to predict risk and talk about muscle composition. We did a lot of this in COVID and saw a lot of relationships to the phase angle and survival from COVID early on. But this is the reality. If you lose 30% of your muscle mass, you're going to have a complication. And if you lose 40% of your muscle mass, you're going to die, but you won't die in the hospital. We'll get you out. We're very good at saving people in the ICU and in the hospitals. That's what we do. But you'll die in rehabilitation, and you'll never probably walk meaningfully again. You'll never go back home. You'll never leave the nursing home. And so these are the victims. And these are the things we need to avoid. And so again, this is particularly pressing here in India because your patients are starting off with lower muscle mass than a lot of patients are. And so to get patients better and give them their lives back, we have to be better. And so how do we optimize this, right? Of course, it takes key nutrition delivery, and that key is protein. 
You can't build a house without bricks, and you cannot maintain or rebuild muscle without protein. And of course, we know that surgical stress, whether you get hit by a surgeon, hit by a car, or hit by, bit by a tiger, our body has one way to respond. We break down muscle to generate amino acids and glucose to run away from the tiger or run away from the surgeon. And this is how our body has to respond. And I have taught for 25 years that it's impossible to go through a major surgery or ICU stay without losing muscle mass and without losing weight. I'm going to tell you that I was wrong, and I'm going to show you why in a minute. But this is why protein is so critical. Our body is very good at turning amino acids into glucose, but it begins to lose muscle mass and protein immediately. And that's where what you guys do as the dietitian comes in. The other challenge patients like Elijah at 89 is, as we age, we become anabolically resistant, which means it takes more grams of protein to build the same amount of muscle when we're old versus when we're young, which is why our protein doses have to go up as people age. Now, not everybody loses muscle as they age. I'll get out of the way. He does more than just eat right to look like that. Although, I think we need to do more than just have our patients eat right if they have a hope of regaining muscle as well. But we can learn a lot from athletes. We have gone to bolus feeding in our ICUs because bolus feeding has been shown to be more anabolic. We as humans weren't meant to be continuously fed. Our body builds muscle best when it goes from a low amino acid concentration in the blood to a high and then a low and a high, which is how we all eat every day, right? Nobody actually eats all day. The other thing is, if you take in whey protein or branched-chain amino acids before you go to bed, you gain 20% more muscle than people who don't. There was a large study done to elderly people in Europe where they gave them either whey protein or branched chains in two different studies. They gained far more muscle mass because you release your anabolic hormones at night. And so these are things athletes do all the time that we can learn from. And of course, exercise has got to be part of this, and our patients have to do the rehab. But our critically ill and our surgical patients have the most challenge. They're the most anabolically resistant. So it's going to take more than protein to get them to gain muscle again. It's going to take anabolic supplements and anabolic amino acids like HMB. And we'll talk about how that's really changing the game in both outcomes and in practice. So what do we do for Elijah? So he's getting better now. His abdomen's closed. And he's now able to start to eat. Will a patient eat enough food on their own to recover? Definitely not. This has been studied. Dietitians in Australia and in the UK have studied this for years. We know the average intake of a surgical or ICU patient on the floor is about 700 calories a day. Not nearly enough. They take in about 0.3 grams per kilo per day of protein. That's the average. There's no way anyone's recovering on that. Because again, surviving these illnesses is not natural. and Food is not going to get them there. They have no appetite. And they don't eat enough protein anyway. And the hot food's not that good. So oral nutrition drinks with protein is the only way to get them what they need. They're easy to drink. They have the protein and nutrients patients need, and they don't take so much quantity because patients get full very easily. Their appetite is poor. And there's a lot of data for this, and I won't belabor the data for this because there's so much, actually. But I really like this study that I was privileged to be part of. This is a 10 million patient, 600 hospital database where we look at real-world practice of what happens to people. We extract the data from hospitals all over the and we look what happens when we give people oral nutrition supplements versus when they don't get them. And when we give them in real world practice, we significantly reduce emissions in our patients in many different classes, elderly patients, pneumonia, CHF, acute MI, virtually all the patients we've ever studied. Surgery, we have publications in colorectal surgery and general surgery as well. And it reduces hospital length of stay. And this actually effect is bigger in surgery than it is in medical patients. But here's the question, and the key of hopefully why you're here today is, is the right nutrition enough to win the war? Even if you get enough protein in, as the dietitians know, they often don't gain weight and they don't gain muscle. So calorie delivery and protein delivery is critical. It will slow muscle mass. If you don't feed them, of course, nothing good happens. But even if you do, they still seem to lose it. And I've taught that this was kind of inevitable, but maybe it's not. And if we're going to create survivors, a, we have to feed them enough protein, but B, we have to do more if they're not going to become victims. And we're not going to change the diets of all of India or all of the U.S., I will say. Our diets are just as poor. And is there an easier way? And there is. HMB is a supplement that I started taking in 1996. I was a medical student in 1996, and I was poor, and I started exercising a lot. And the gym at my medical school didn't have air conditioning. It was just too hot for me. And so I joined a gym as a personal trainer to make money, but also to get a gym with air conditioning. And the gym was a professional bodybuilding gym. 
were famous bodybuilders, some that beat Arnold Schwarzenegger, worked out every day. They taught me more about nutrition and metabolism in the six months I worked there than I've learned in the entirety of my career, because that's what they do for a living. And all of them took this. This was developed in the 90s for athletes to help people gain muscle mass without gaining fat mass. And it worked brilliantly. It helped me gain 60 pounds in nine months, not taking any other illegal drugs. A lot of them did, but I did. And it was like a miracle. And so athletes have been using these things for years, and they're always 20 years ahead of us in medicine. And what it does is it allows nutrition to actually be anabolically signaled to turn into muscle, in addition to the fact that you have to have the protein. And this is not a synthetic agent or anything else. This is a naturally occurring amino acid. It's a derivative of leucine. It's found in a lot of the foods we eat in small amounts. And it's a naturally occurring piece of avocados, catfish, eggs. To get enough HMB, though, to have an effect, you eat thousands of avocados in a day, or hundreds of catfish, which, of course, no one's going to do. But it works in two ways, both of the things we want it to do. One is it's anabolic, signaling to the mTOR pathway, and it's anti-catabolic by reducing the kappa B signaling and improving mitochondrial function. And so, as I said, this evil pathway that our patients get into where we feed and feed and feed them and they don't make muscle, it breaks this pathway. This is the body's natural way of anabolizing and signaling anabolism for our patients. And that's how we break the cycle. And this now has got hundreds of studies. A lot of these were originally in athletes. It was used widely in HIV and cancer to preserve lean body mass and gain back muscle strength. And so there's a lot of data in this. It's very safe. There's never been side effects seen. And it's been studied for long periods of time in patients. And so it's used in healthy people in studies and in sick people. And this is one of the healthy people studies. This is where elderly women randomized to receive HMB nutrition or not. And what they found was they had better muscle density. But more importantly, they improved their six-minute walk test. And so that's a combination of muscle and endurance. And that's where the mitochondrial piece that we're discovering seems to come in. So it does both. And these are in healthy people. But it also helps sick people, of course. These are hip fracture patients. One of the most common elderly diseases we see is these hip fracture injuries. And they were randomized, and they help heal wounds faster. It should be used for, actually, it's recommended or indicated for pressure ulcers in the hospital. It's how we reduce pressure ulcers in our hospitalized patients. But it also improves their mobility quite significantly, actually, in the people who took this after their hip fractures. This is one of the most important studies I'm going to show you in this whole talk, actually. Remember I told you bed rest inevitably loses significant muscle mass? Well, one of the most famous muscle physiologists in the world did a study where he looked at elderly people who were bed rested, and if you just put them in bed, they lose a lot of muscle. He used tracer technologies and other high-tech metabolic techniques to do this. If you give them HMB, it totally reverses or prevents the loss of muscle in bed rest. And this is, again, he's the editor-in-chief of one of the highest impact factor journals in nutrition, clinical nutrition. His name is McDoitz in the world. And this was done by a really expert physiologist. This is the only intervention I've ever seen that can reverse the muscle loss from bed rest and prevent it from happening. So this, to me, was miraculous data when he published this. And he told me about it. He called me one day and said, you won't believe this. I've been doing this in elderly people. And so, this has now gone through quite a few studies, and there's meta-analyses, actually, of muscle mass in elderly people. And, of course, it does preserve muscle mass in elderly people across many, many studies now. It's not just one or two. There's a large body of data for this. And it's been looked at specifically in a range of diagnoses. This is a big meta-analysis that a pediatrician in the UK, Danny Baer is her name, she looked at all the illness-related studies of different forms of HMB, and it's mixed with all kinds of different things in these studies. It can be given alone, it can be given in oral nutrition drinks, it can be given with arginine glutamine. And it improved muscle strength in almost all the studies across the different populations and the different ways it's given. And then, of course, what about people with a ventilator? Do they break down more muscle when they're given this or less? And they were able to show that Amino acid breakdown and protein breakdown, catabolism, was significantly reduced when they received this. And ultimately, their quality of life, measured by quality of life scores, improved. And that's what matters, right? I don't think we all care if we stop the breakdown of muscle if we don't improve the quality of life. And I think that's And so again, looking at hip fracture patients specifically, these are patients where they lose muscle because they're immobile. 
they don't ever recover. These are people that go to nursing homes and never get better and die of pneumonia and blood clots. And what they found was giving HMB to these patients could prevent the weight loss and muscle loss they suffered after a hip fracture, which is what ultimately leads to their complications and their deaths. And it didn't increase fat mass. That was what it was built to do right for athletes. This was actually developed for athletes not to gain fat, but to gain muscle, and it did that. But it prevented the loss of muscle mass. And so I think this was really impressive data because in hip fracture, that's really what leads to a lot of patients ultimately dying from the fracture in the first place. And so again, this was really beneficial to these patients. And so again, remember the, the bed rester I told you, and this was the first thing we could find to prevent that. And I think that's what's so critical is that's where a lot of our patients get in trouble. And so that's really, really a critical piece. And then even in COPD on the ventilator, I got asked about COPD today, patients that received HMB on the ventilator for COPD were able to be weaned off twice as often when they received HMB. And so this was a trial where they looked specifically at the use of HMB to wean the ventilator. And I was saying I've done this in pediatric patients who are event dependent, sometimes for years. We used to have them brought to Chicago where I used to work and we'd use HMB and creatine a long time ago when those weren't so common to wean them off the ventilator quite successfully. And it reduces CRP. It seems to reduce some of the inflammatory response that makes muscle mass hard to gain in these patients. So there's effects on many, many clinical outcomes that have been studied. This is widely studied, but this is the most important trial clinically I'm going to show you. And this is why in our hospital at Duke, this is the only oral nutrition supplement we use, the HMB-containing oral nutrition supplement high protein. This is a randomized trial of patients with different medical diagnoses, six of them in over 70 centers across the United States. And they looked at 90-day mortality in patients who got either an HMB-containing protein supplement or a control. And what they found was that mortality dropped by half at 90 days and the patients who received this for the 90 days after hospitalization. And so this was the largest randomized trial of any oral nutrition supplement ever done. And it's the only one that has this kind of data, which is what compelled us to start using and our dietitians use this for most of our patients. And I think most impressively, every 20 patients who were sent home on this from the hospital, it saved a life. So that in the US, we worry a lot about cost effectiveness. This is more cost effective than the influenza vaccine and it's safer. And so this was really compelling, and this is what led us to adopt this as our primary oral nutrition supplement. And of course, it improved hand grip strength, which is ultimately what we wanted to do as well. But I think most importantly, it improved survival. And that was what we found most compelling. And so it did both. It's been used in surgical recovery across ranges of surgeries. It's been used in hip fractures. It's been used in knee surgeries and knee repairs. It's been used in cardiac surgery to improve outcomes and it's been used in pelvic fractures. And so there's a large body of data across many surgical subtypes where these HMB supplements have improved outcomes in a range of ways from length of stay to muscle mass and other complications. Now, what about Elijah? Our 89-year-old who after his colorectal surgery had a cardiac arrest, who he and his family desperately want to have go back to his life to meet his granddaughter. What did we do for him? Well, first off, we started an oral nutrition supplement with HMB. We got his protein dose up to two grams per kilo, and he was very good about drinking his supplements, which are key. We started testosterone. His testosterone level was five. He's 89 years old. It's not surprising. We actually do this a lot, and we measure this. Some people need more anabolic. You know, but testosterone takes weeks to months to work, and so it's not fast, but it's an investment for the future. We gave him creatine, which has a large body of data for improving strength in the elderly and in athletes. And we corrected his vitamin D. You have to correct vitamin D or muscle mass is very hard to gain. The muscle depends on vitamin D to use nutrients effectively. And you can't correct ICU and surgical patients with small doses. We gave 100,000 IU of D3. That's what it takes to bump their levels. There was a study in JAMA that looked at 350 critically ill patients and they saw reduced mortality from 540,000 units of vitamin D. And that didn't lead to high levels in anybody. So there's a large range of safety, but you have to use 50 to 100,000 or you won't correct it. It has to be D3. Physical therapy was very active with him. They got him doing sit to stands and they brought him rubber bands to work with because the surgeons always tell him he can't lift more than five kilos. Um, and the family brought his own dumbbells in for Elijah. And so he worked hard. But this is the question, right? Remember, this is still an 89-year-old who spent a good number of days in the ventilator and had a cardiac arrest in the operating room. Can he survive this? 
I can tell you the nurses and the young physicians said there was no way he would ever survive this much, let's leave the hospital. Well, I can tell you after we started these things that Elijah walked out of our hospital 28 days later after his cardiac arrest. He walked out of the hospital and went home. On his 90th birthday, and that's the truth, I'll never forget him. He's one of the most meaningful patients I've ever cared for in his family. This is a picture of Elijah. This is actually him. His family asked me to use this picture to tell his story, holding his weights the day he went home. He lived for two more years. He met his granddaughter. He fixed his church roof again, and he passed away peacefully at home rather than getting CPR in a hospital. He had a life worth living. And I have to admit, I wouldn't think it was possible either. But this is what's possible. And why do I care so much as I finish, right? It's sort of odd that an anesthesiologist critical care doctor would spend his whole life studying nutrition and talking to dietitians much of his day. And why I hope the fact you're here right now, you care as well. And you've heard a little bit of this story. How many of you had surgery yourselves? Raise your hands. That's a good number. Well, all of you eventually will, at least if you live in the United States. There's data that shows that every U.S. citizen will have 9.2 surgical procedures in their lifetime. Atul Gawande did this data. Now, about half of these are cosmetic procedures. But they're still surgeries. And so someday, this will be you or someone you love. Although I hope for your sake that some of you will ever escape being in the operating room because I've used up quite a few of your surgeries already. As you heard, this was me. This was me at age 15, as being with ulcerative colitis. I was on TBN for a year. Dietitians saved my life, which is why I've been so passionate about your role in the hospital since. And as you heard, ultimately, my colon perforated after 40 units of blood. I ended up in an ICU, ultimately where I would go to medical school one day, and had my colon removed. I had one of the first ileal pouches. In fact, I had the first ileal pouch done in a teenage male in Chicago. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work very well. And what they don't tell you about ulcerative colitis and IBD is they tell you you're cured after you get your colon out, but you actually aren't because ultimately you get bowel obstructions and adhesions. And so throughout my life, as you heard, I have had 27 surgeries. I have 140 centimeters total bowel right now. No ileum, no colon. I've had an ostomy since I was a child. And so this is an everyday part of my life nutrition is. This was me in 2014, probably in the best shape of my life. It was with my son visiting my grandfather. About a month later, I ate some quinoa. Don't ever eat quinoa if you've had surgery, and don't let your patients do it either. Got a bowel obstruction. I was a good thousand miles from home, but I flew all the way back to the Colorado where I live from the east coast of the US because I wanted to control my care. Doctors make terrible patients. Unfortunately, I showed up in my own emergency room 18 hours later with a lactate of 10 in shock with a severe bowel obstruction and edematous ischemic bowel. Was rushed to the operating room. In a scary moment, the surgeon who approached me actually was a new surgeon who'd been out for about six months. I had trained her. And I said, there's no way you're operating on me. I said, find an old person. She did. Was in the operating room for eight hours, getting adhesions lysed. Ended up in my own ICU where I worked. Wrote my own TPN with my dietitians. Thought 25 kcals per kilo would be enough. I weigh 100 kilos, 2,500 calories should be enough. I was fit, I was young. Shouldn't need more than that, right? Remember that dose. I went from looking like this to looking like this in 17 days. I lost 20 kilos in about two weeks. I couldn't walk down the hallway of the hospital without being short of breath. I'd been running 5K every day before that. Couldn't walk 20 feet. No one's immune, I thought, to this. It made me kind of sad, actually, because I thought I should be immune to this. I'm healthy coming in. Six months later, I couldn't pick up my own son at Christmas. He wasn't that big, but I wasn't that strong yet. It took months to years to recover from this. Nutrition optimization had to become an everyday part of my life. It took two years and 4,000 calories a day, remember that number too, and two grams per kilo per day of protein to recover. I, I like to show pictures of me with my ostomy because I care for a lot of ostomy patients, young patients with IBD. And they inevitably tell me that they'd rather die than have an ostomy on their side. And I say to them, there's nothing you could do before that you can't do with an ostomy. And I, I really hope that gives them hope because a lot of them come back and tell me, gosh, I should have had surgery sooner. The ostomy was the best thing that ever happened to me. But they don't think that when they first get them. 
And so exercise had to be critical to that as well. And so patient recovery became a passion of mine from an early age. Because I always tell my surgery trainees that in the middle of the night, when that guy comes in with a bad abdomen, please come down and see him because it might be me. And I knew someday it would be again. And last year, unfortunately, that happened. I began to have bowel obstruction after bowel obstruction. And in fact, my bowel was tethered to my ureter and I was getting kidney failure. Every time I got a bowel obstruction, I'd get hydronephrosis and my creatinine would rise. And so after these recurrent bowel obstructions, I went to our bowel transplant surgeon at Duke. Her name's Deb Sudan. This is what she does. She operates on people with bad abdomens. And I said, you've got to fix this. And she said, Paul, you're short gut. You're nearly on TBN already. I, I'm going to have to say, are you ready for that? To be on TBN the rest of your life, maybe. I said, you've got to do what you've got to do. I can't live like this. And so I thought, gosh, this is going to be the biggest operation I've ever had. It's going to take me even longer to recover than two years, because now I'm 10 years older. Not as young as I was. Maybe not. Maybe there's things we can do differently for our patients, and surgical recovery needs to begin long before the operation happens. So these are all the things I take every day. When I come to India, I bring a separate suitcase for my supplements by themselves. And I've taken these every day for a long time. And this is what I did to get ready. And so I went to the operating room with our bowel transplant surgeon, and she operated on me for 13 hours, removed 20 more centimeters of bowel, took out my gallbladder, was tethered to my bowel obstruction, was admitted to my own ICU. This is a picture of me the day I was admitted to my ICU where I work and was cared for by my amazing nurses and my amazing surgery residents. And of course, I tell my patients they've got to walk the day after surgery, so I did too. This is me walking with my A-line and my tubes and my lines, wandering around the ICU I work in the day after surgery. And I thought I was doing pretty well, but then two nights later, about three days after surgery, much like Elijah actually, I woke up with a fever and sweating, and my gown was soaked, and I looked down and there was stool pouring from my incision. I developed an intestinal leak as well, an anastomotic leak, was rushed back to the operating room in shock, myself, much like Elijah. And in fact, my surgeon tried twice I leaked two days later the same way, stool pouring from my incision. Septic shock, edema up to here. Ended up on the ventilator in my ICU. This was me about a year ago. On my, in my own ICU, on a ventilator for longer than I wanted. And as I woke up, I realized this is the sickest I've ever been in my life. And now I have a persistent GI fistula, my greatest fear. We know fistula patients may stay in the hospital for months, may never get better. I thought to myself, I may never see my children grow up. I may never walk again. I may never be able to eat or live a normal life ever again. And I'm definitely now going to lose a lot of muscle mass. I'll probably never be able to exercise like I did before. I'll probably never be able to walk like I did before. Maybe not. We do things differently. Well, one of the things that we now do differently is we use indirect calorimetry. We measure objectively what our patients need. We wouldn't give vasopressors without measuring our blood pressure. We wouldn't have people on a ventilator without a blood gas. How can we give nutrition without knowing what our patients need? Our equations aren't very good. Well, this is what my measurements were before and after surgery. This is my resting energy expenditure, 3,000 calories. So when I wrote my TBN in 2014, I was underfeeding myself dramatically. And this is if I don't move at all, right? And I was doing rehab at this point. So my dietitians and I wrote a 4,000 calorie TPN. If any of you ever wrote a 4,000 calorie TPN, I hadn't. Seems scary, but we had data. And you would never do it without objective data. And so I wandered around on my small lipid and my 4,000 calorie TPN and kept myself on my testosterone. I don't absorb cholesterol, or gut, don't absorb cholesterol. I had low testosterone. I broke a bone brushing off a tree skiing with my son and realized my testosterone level was low, so I stayed on that was discharged on TPN to home for months. This is me at home on my TPN, carrying my little backpack around. And then was finally when my fish shop went down, transitioned to the same oral nutrition supplements that HMB my patients take. It's my dog, my dog's my coach, keeps me going. But it takes more than just this to do better after surgery, right? I also had to exercise. This is me on my exercise bike with my fistula drain, my ostomy, my TPN line. Anyone can exercise. <coughs> So any of you that think tonight when you go home you're too tired to exercise, you're not really. Anyone can exercise, and our patients can too. I don't care how many lines and tubes they have. The next time you feel like you can't work it's out, you think of this guy. It's my wife. And the interesting thing I noticed was I looked in the mirror while I was in the hospital so sick, my face wasn't getting thinner. 
and I didn't feel like I was getting weaker. And as it turned out, I only lost about four kilos the whole time I was septic. And I gained it all back within a week on TPN before I was ever eating, none of which I thought was possible. And some of it took doing exercises my surgeon wasn't excited about. I learned to use rubber bands to keep the big weights away. But she said, you can't lift more than five kilos. Well, eight weeks after that surgery, my wife and I had a competition. My wife and I dance Argentine tango competitively. And we competition. And in that competition, I lift her over my head five times. She weighs a little more than five kilos. Not much, a little bit. And so I said to my surgeon, can I pick my wife up over my head next week? She said, wait, you only had surgery eight weeks ago. I said, true. She said, do you think you can do it? And I said, I think I can. And so eight weeks after that operation and that ICU stay, we did this and we competed. And I picked up. This is the song we danced to. That's why you hear it. I hadn't lost any strength either. I was just as strong. I weighed the same and my muscle mass was the same. I didn't think that was possible, but it is. Our patients don't have to get ICU-acquired weakness. They don't have to lose muscle mass, and they don't have to lose strength. We can do this better. Again, you have to do things right. I take a lot of things every day. Not all our patients are going to know how to do that. But perhaps they could get help. Nutrition matters. This was me four months after surgery. Remember, it took me two years last time, and I was 10 years younger four months. Pre-op preparation and recovery is part of everyday life for our patients, and it needs to be taught to them that that's the case. And how many of our patients will know how to do this? Who's going to teach them? You are. The fact that you're here tonight means you care enough to do this, and you have all the tools. You have more tools than most hospitals, actually. You have a BIA. You have ways to measure. Most hospitals don't. And you have the most dietitians I think I've ever seen in an Indian hospital, which is brilliant. You can never have enough. Hospital recovery has to begin at the day of hospital admission and continue long after discharge. And we have to teach our patients this. We have to train our patients for the marathon of the surgical and cancer and treatments they're facing. Again, behavioral change has to start with us. We have to be good examples for our patients. But if we're going to create survivors and not victims, getting people out of the hospital is not enough. Winning the battle against infection and sepsis and surgery is not enough if we lose giving patients a life back at the end of it all. Because otherwise, why do we do this at all? Because that's why our patients come to us. They don't come to us to get out of the hospital. They come to us to go back to a life they want. If we're going to do that, we have to be better than we are. And I think you face unique challenges in India. Because this is an emergency here. But we can be better. And we have the tools and the things to help our patients do this. We're not going to change everyone's diet. But interventions like HMB, and delivering enough protein and helping our patients realize that's an important part of their health care. I think even writing prescriptions for the protein supplements so they realize they're important and actually drink them. They're just as important as the drugs and the antihypertensives they take. It's key, and this is essential to their recovery. They're never going to eat enough food to ever recover. I can't. I've tried. And of course, exercise is key, and it's a different lecture for a different day, but our patients have to be told they have to be active. If you want to learn more, we know we don't teach nutrition well to our doctors. So to, because of that, we started an online nutrition fellowship at Duke. And anyone from around the world can sign up, including dietitians and physicians. And over 24 weeks, we have the best nutrition teachers in the world, the people I would want to learn from, teach one-week modules where they give lectures and interact with people from around the world across discussion boards. And then you have a Zoom call with your classmates. There's only 22 per class and the expert, and you get to know them, and you get to know how people practice. In the first year, we hope we train five MDs around the world. We trained 13 from seven countries and four continents. And there were a lot of dietitians in the group, so the MDs learned from the dietitians. And we learn how people practice nutrition all around the world. And so we're starting another module set in January, and I hope we see some of you in these classes. You can take them by themselves, and you don't have to take the whole thing. But the reality is if we're going to take more than just responsibility for what happens in the hospital and actually change what happens afterwards, we're going to have to be better. And then we can take people like this. This was me not 12 months ago. We can have them walking on their ventilators, hopefully, and then have them go home like Elijah did, even at 90 years old, and go back to a life worth living and a life that they came to us to return. And with that, 
All we have left to do is to do it. And I do encourage all of you to follow on social media. This is the best way to keep up with the literature. People following people like me and others, we post all the latest nutrition literature, critical care literature. I, I make my ICU trainees and fellows and surgical residents sign up for Twitter and Instagram. It's the best way to follow the literature. There's no way you can read all the journals. But we post all the new studies that come out, and it's a great way to follow. And then I'm happy to share any of these slides or any of these papers with any of you if you want to email me. And if you ever have questions, I'm happy to answer them, because that's what gives meaning to the illnesses I've been through, is the ability to help someone else not go through it. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. I think uh, that's the most powerful, touching talk you have ever heard. I think you just have literally goosebumps of all over the body. Thank you so much, actually. It's been a wonderful experience that you've gone through. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I think you can all always take uh, any questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You said this is a uh, natural supplement, actually. It is. Um, because you said it's a part of the branch chain amino acid solution and everything. Yeah. So is it uh, synthetically made or uh, like is it extracted? So yes, it's extracted. I think it's actually, actually most amino acids that appear in um, like TPN and a lot of the drinks we drink are synthesized. But this actually is synthesized as a naturally occurring one of the amino acids, right? This is not something that doesn't occur in the body and doesn't occur in our food. It just is synthesized much like we synthesize our TPN amino acids um, in, in, in the way all, the, all of them are made and then placed into oral nutrition supplements and protein drinks. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's added to protein drinks after being made, much like branched chain amino acids are made or glutamine is made or other single amino acids that we give, they're, they're made that way. But of course, they're key parts of what our biology is already. Thank so you, yeah, you. yeah, but so that's it's made much like our other amino acids are. It's it's another amino acid derivative. Hello, please. Uh, thanks for nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am a vascular surgeon. Many of my patients who are suffering from peripheral arterial disease, we give very high dose of statins, atorvastatin yes. 40 milligram or juvastatin 20 milligram. Yeah. They com complain of lot of muscle mass uh, wasting. Yeah, they break Can down. we uh, give this medicine? Uh, yeah. As supplement. It seems like an ideal intervention for patients that you're giving a lot of statins to to cause that kind of muscle breakdown and muscle atrophy. Steroids, same. If you give corticosteroids to patients, that leads to the same kind of muscle breakdown, and that's where we think things like it can really make a difference. I think, actually, you're the first vascular surgeon to ask me that question, but that's a brilliant thing. That would be an interesting study to itself, actually. But I, I think it, we have great benefit because we take care of a lot of vascular patients too, and I see that. That's a really good thought. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for that question. So that's a good question. We do, but, but again, the only way we can give it right now in the U.S. is as part of an oral supplement. And so for the really sick multi-organ failure patient, right, unless you're going to pour it down a feeding tube, which you could do, it's not part of intral nutrition formulas yet. It's only part of oral nutrition formulas. So I typically start it in our ICU patients once they transition to oral nutrition. Although your question is well taken, why do we wait? Because in a lot of our patients, we're feeding them internally sometimes for a long period of time. Um, and so some of the dietitians have occasionally asked, why don't we give the HMB supplement just down their feeding tube? Especially since you work with mostly powdered formulas anyway, it sounds as though it doesn't seem like it would be a stretch to use the liquid combinations these come in because they'd be very easy, probably easier than your powdered formulas to give in a feeding tube. And you only have to give it twice a day. You could give it as a bolus feed a couple times a day, and it would probably work most effectively that way, and probably be just as easy as your intro feeds are now. It's a great question, actually. I hadn't thought of that. So yeah, why yeah. isn't it added into the Aspen guidelines or Aspen guidelines? Still That's a good question. We, you know, it's funny. We, we have guidelines around more obscure things like taurine and, I mean, which is brilliant in surgery, of course, but not used anywhere else. We would never use it in the ICU, of course, for the most part. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm not on the Aspen Guideline Committee. I, I, I am the chair of 
the Surgical Nutrition Guideline Committee for Evidence-Based Preoperative Medicine, and we have talked about adding this to the next go-round because now there's a large enough mass of data to meaningfully make comment. I think it's been, most of this data is five to seven years old. It's pretty recent. Some of it's only two and three years old. So a lot of it has been, the last time meaningfully asthma guidelines were updated was 2016. A lot of this data didn't exist then, and none of these meta-analyses existed. And so I think some of it's the limitation of these data sets are all quite new. And some of it is somebody on the committee just needs to bring it up and say, this is a new area we need to address. And I think some of the meta-analyses that some of the PhD dietitians have been doing around the world are going to add to that because that's what, for a guideline, you, you kind of would like to synthesize the data from all the studies in some meaningful way and have some way to draw outcomes. And that's, those studies most of them are about a year old. And so my hunch will be this will be one of the next steps that you'll see in guidelines to come. We probably will address it the next surgical guideline. It's a great question, right, because it seems like an obvious thing, especially when there will be really obscure things in some of our guidelines, like taurine and other things. So, good so question. Brands change to show up in our guidelines. And as a part of treatment for yeah. elderly patients, elderly patients usually have a lot of muscle wasting and all. Yeah. Instead of uh, actually giving them a lot of other protein supplements, uh, yes. do you suggest only giving HMB? So we... We normally uh, yeah. give in an elderly patient some amount of protein supplements, but yeah. probably I'm not very really sure uh, whether we're going to give a complete setup or something. But right. definitely we have not given HMB as far as I know. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. So this is our primary supplement that we use in all our patients in our hospitalized setting. So if you could start an orange supplement in our hospital, this is always our first choice. Occasionally, you know, if someone's got a really severe, unstable diabetes, a lot of insulin, you know, issues. It, it does have a fair bit of calories in it because that's the point. It's supposed to help people regain weight. And sometimes we'll use other supplements in those patients. But there aren't many patients we can't use this in. And so this is our standard oral nutrition formula for people that... And I, I walk into the room in the ICU, actually, frequently, and I say, don't worry about eating the food. I don't care if you eat any of the food. But if you can drink two or three of these a day, you'll reach your protein goals for most people. And you're going to get a whole lot more nutrition out of them because I know they're not going to eat the food, and the food isn't that good for them anyway because they don't pick. I mean, they get to pick what they eat. They don't usually eat good things, nor do they eat enough. And so the, the first thing I say is, before you eat anything, drink these. This is far more than eating any food, and so that usually works. They're usually willing. We find a flavor they like, and, and most people are willing to do it. So this is our go-to, and there aren't many people we can't give it to. Luckily, yeah, that's a good question. Please. Hello, sir. I'm Dr. Anusha, physician. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a doubt. We see many patients with uh, osteoporosis who come up, postmenopausal women especially. Yeah. So they have a lot of sarcopenia associated. Yeah. So can we give this protein powder to them? For sure. And, and this typically comes as a drink. And so it, it, it's pretty simple for patients to take. Um, they just have to drink the supplement. And the nice thing is the supplement has a lot of protein in it as well and good quality protein. And so it's a, a nice, easy thing. Like, I have my mom on it still because she's still recovering from her heart surgery. She takes it twice a day. She takes it in the morning at night. And that gives you a sufficient dose. If you take this supplement twice a day, you get a sufficient dose of the HMB to be equivalent to what's studied in all these trials. Yeah, and so that's where you want to You want to hit that target dose of about th typically three grams a day. Some people think two even will do it for smaller. I'm 105 kilos, so I take four. I, I just have to believe there has to be something weight based data would not say that. Their data has not shown that there's a weight-based effect of this supplement to some degree. Most of the studies have been done with three. And so that's enough. And that's typically, they come in one and a half grams per serving is Thank how much you. HMB. Yeah, that's a good question. Anything else? Please. Uh, one last question. Yeah. You want to? Yeah. Very motivating talk, sir. Thank you. Uh, when, when we give a high-protein diet, yeah. the branching amino acids are also high in that supplement. Yes. So do you Maybe. think still there is a role of HMB there? For sure. So this has been looked at against branching amino acids, and, and it has some unique properties, of course. Um, and leucine is not as potent. Leucine has some similar effects to this, but it's not nearly as potent. The other challenge is, have you ever tried to take the six or eight grams of leucine it takes to begin to have this effect? It tastes terrible. It's not very soluble. And there aren't any supplements that contain that amount. So, and if, even if they did, it's not nearly as potent as, as HMB, as HMB is far more potent than leucine. 
And so to get this benefit, we've never been able to see this benefit with branch chains. We, we haven't been able to see this inhibition of catabolism or this ability to eliminate the weight loss and the muscle loss from bed rest with the branch chains. That, they don't do that. Um, there is something unique about HMB and its effect on catabolism that is separate from what branch chains do. I will tell you why I take branch chains. I take them at night because I want to ensure I have all the essential amino acids to build muscle overnight, but I take HMB with it. Um, and so I think the combination is the best of all worlds. Because then you have the building blocks you need from the branch chains and the HMB an anabolic signal to actually signal your body to help make muscle and to reduce catabolism. I don't know if we have HMB as it is available in the market in India, but if you have it with adding to a supplement, mm -hmm. is the absorption very good, or is there any difference between either of them? I don't think so. I, I think, you know, the easiest way, at least that I know of what's available in India, is through the protein supplement drinks. I, I don't know um, if it's available other ways. I can tell you I, I do take it as a separate pill myself because at this point, of course, I'm not taking protein supplements anymore because I can't eat vegetables or fruits because they'll obstruct me. I put whey protein and honey and frozen fruits and vegetables into a blender, and I, that's how I get all my vegetables and fruit is berries and kale and other things put into a blender with whey protein and honey and milk. But um, then I take my HB separately. But for a better part of my recovery for the first year, I was taking the, the nutrition supplement to ensure I was getting the H and B and the other nutrients I needed um, because I couldn't necessarily drink even those higher fiber drinks I was drinking. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll put all this into practice. And Wonderful. See how yeah, no, works. they're good questions Thank you. for Thank sure. You so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much for the inspirational talk, and it really motivates to do better in our yeah. work. And a great lot of ideas to. Uh, take home and yeah. implement it in practice. Yeah. And we actually thank you as a gratitude. I request Dr. G. V. Rao, our chief of uh, our director and the chief of gastro uh, surgeries, to give you a small token of oh, memento. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Please. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Is that the cancer we do? Oh, and maybe when Pinsa is. Yeah, yeah, or right after Pinsa. Yeah. Thank you. I would love to come back if you have it in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And for the dietitians, thank you for what you do every day. You guys save lives, and you don't hear it enough. So know you're appreciated. I thank all of you for making time and coming for this very enlightening lecture. I thank the management for giving me this permission to conduct this meeting here. And a very fruitful and a lot of take home messages. I thank Abbott for actually getting Paul Vishmeyer here to the hospital for this wonderful lecture. Thank you and please have your dinner. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Wonderful. Good to see you again, yes, as well. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Try to take my computer back apart. Mm -hmm.